The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar brought to you by NEI and Juniper Unmanned. Today's topics are going to include, first of all, an, an introduction, um, and then we're going to take a look at the new FAA UAS Rule Part 107, uh, and really more so how it applies. Next, we'll cover an overview of the Trimble UX5 HP aircraft system, um, a little dive into the aerial imaging processing software that's both Trimble Business Center aerial photogrammetry module and the UAS master software. And to close, we'll switch over to Juniper Unman for some specifics on the UAS Rule Part 107 and some training components and objectives they bring to the table. To conclude with a question and answer session. So my name is Chad Hicks. I'm the UAS Solutions Lead for NEI. I'm also a mapping and GIS consultant and Trimble Certified Product Specialist. I'm going to start actually with UAS and really instrumentation as a whole uh, way back in 96 uh, with the U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, since then, I've earned an associate's in information systems technology and a bachelor's in business. I uh, served as a GIS manager for nearly five years and then have been a Trimble representative since 2008. So first and foremost, what is UAS? I'm going to assume that everyone on the call may not be fully aware of the differences between just a drone aircraft and actually a complete UAS. Uh, the biggest difference is, of course, the S there, an unmanned aircraft system. It consists of not only the aircraft, but a control system such as the ground control station, a control link or specialized data link, and then other related supporting equipment, i.e. software, launchers, control devices, things of that nature. More so than just a drone that you would commonly fly for, say, any purposes, an unmanned aircraft system, a complete, fully functional system allowing the capture of sensor data, in our case, imagery, the processing of said data, and its final delivery or use as a product. So, small unmanned aircraft rule part 107. This is brand new as of last week. The FAA announced this rule. The new rule will take effect in August, offer safety regulations for unmanned aircraft drones weighing less than 55 pounds that are conducting non-hobbyist operations, specifically commercial operations. Under the final rule, the person actually flying a drone must be at least 16 years old and have a remote pilot certificate with a small UAS rating or be directly supervised by someone with such certificate. To qualify for a remote pilot certificate, an individual must either pass an initial aeronautical knowledge test at an FAA-approved knowledge testing center or have an existing non-student Part 61 pilot certificate. Uh, first question and answer probably is, is where are the tests and how can I get signed up? That information has actually not been published by the FAA yet. Uh, as you saw earlier, this rule does not fully go into effect until the end of August. Moreover, operators are responsible for ensuring a drone is safe before flying, but the FAA is not requiring small UAS to comply to current agency airworthiness standards for aircraft certification. Instead, the remote pilot will simply have to perform a pre-flight visual and operational check of the small UAS to ensure that safety pertinent systems are functioning properly. This includes checking the communication link between the control station and the UAS. Long story short here, this is a difference between what was previously published before an airworthiness standard or certificate was required on some level that is no longer part and no longer included in this new Part 107 rule. So finally, translation. Previously, the commercial use of UAS was not allowed. 
Then, in 2012, the FAA Modernization and Reform Act was published and passed by Congress. Included in that was Section 333, which adopted the use of UAS with approval. And with approval is kind of the big uh, in parentheses difference there. Uh, the new small UAS rule, Part 107, now allows for the use of UAS nationwide within certain operational limitations. And that's always a big question as well. What are those limitations? These are probably some of the biggest. Uh, there is a much, much longer list, uh, but these are the ones that will mainly affect everyone interested in UAS operations. One, the aircraft must be registered obviously after it's been purchased with the FAA. Uh, the operations can only be conducted in the Class G airspace. You must keep the aircraft in sight, known as visual line of sight, VLOS. Must fly under 400 feet. There is now, and this was a previous publication, a nationwide blanket COA of 400 feet uh, across the entire United States. You must fly during the day. You must fly at or below 100 miles per hour. You must yield right away to any manned aircraft or piloted aircraft. And you must not fly over people or from a moving vehicle. Now, most of those you see have an asterisk at the end. That basically means that all of those rules or limitations are subject to waiver. You can still submit and request special conditions or special circumstances outside of these normal limitations. Uh, the entire complete list of these limitations is in the Part 107 rule and it is available at faa.gov slash UAS. So, to summarize, this is basically the process. If, if you or the organization you work for are interested in acquiring a UAS and, and becoming a a UAS operator and conducting uh, UAS aircraft operations. You would simply purchase the aircraft, uh, attend the Juniper unmanned training on operating the aircraft uh, as well as the software, register that aircraft with the FAA. If you have or had a 333 exemption in place, you can still operate under that exemption until its expiration. Uh, and they all do eventually expire. In addition to that, you don't have to wait until your exemption expires, or if you don't have an exemption, you can obtain that remote pilot certificate. Uh, if you're not an existing certified pilot, you'll simply attend the aeronautical knowledge course and complete the test. If you are an existing pilot, you would simply complete the online training course to get that additional certificate added to your credentials. So that was part 107 of the uh, new unmanned aircraft rule. We're going to transition now to talk specifically about the Trimble UX-5 HP aircraft. It consists, uh, or it is one of the Trimble UAS portfolio. Uh, consisting of a high precision surveying and mapping solution. Uh, its predecessor was the Trimble UX-5. It was basically the standard in the industry. Uh, it was actually the first fixed-wing aircraft to receive the FAA Section 333 exemption. Uh, and then finally, the Trimble ZX-5 is our one multi-rotor aircraft uh, designed for a more flexible mapping and inspection solutions or applications. So the different solutions are for different applications. You may wonder why two fixed-wing aircraft, why one multi-rotor. Uh, the differences are clear. Uh, the fixed-wing aircraft is specifically designed for large open areas, horizontal mapping, very highly efficient and effective data capture uh, of, like I said, a, a larger area, whereas the multi-rotor vertical takeoff and landing solution and the multi-rotor is specifically designed for your smaller, really more obstructed areas, uh, more horizontal and vertical type application, 
And as a plus, it could also include a visual inspection capability. Uh, that's something that uh, was very, very popular when it was announced. Uh, it's actually a live video feed that allows you to fly the aircraft uh, around the structure to, to, to capture uh, live video and conduct an actual inspection. So the Trimble UX5HP is considered the best and most advanced aircraft, especially in the Trimble UAS portfolio. Uh, it offers the very best in, in overall accuracy and capability. Uh, this is the system overview. Everything you see here is, is what makes up that system or makes up that UAS. Uh, first and foremost, the aircraft wing or the aircraft itself. Uh, the onboard sensor, which is the camera and now the G-Box or GNSS receiver. Uh, the E-Box is your, your onboard autopilot or control system, as well as a launcher and field software, also known as the ground control station. And then to complete the system is the office software. You basically have a choice here, uh, either TBC, aerial photogrammetry, uh, or UAS master. Uh, and we'll talk more about the differences between those a little later on. So a little bit about the UX5 HP wing itself. Uh, it's a very simplistic design, but in that simplicity is really its most advanced technology. This type of wing design provides some of the most stable uh, or the most stable platform uh, for conducting aerial imagery capture. In other words, you can imagine Flying an aircraft, even if you're in a manned aircraft, and holding a camera while an aircraft is moving, that in and of itself is the biggest challenge. So when this aircraft is in flight, it's extremely stable. Uh, it, it flies extremely straight and level during its image, imagery capture. Um, a longer propeller was adapted to this new HP aircraft really to support the additions in weight. Uh, also some changes. Uh, to the overall size itself. A more powerful motor uh, was also provided with the HP model. Otherwise, everything remains the same. Only two control surfaces uh, on this aircraft, the elevons on either side of the wing, and of course the rotating propeller. And then the final addition is that GNSS receiver antenna on the right side, uh, basically to provide that GNSS reception for that onboard G-Box. Inside the payload cell uh, is basically where all of the components are, are housed. Uh, the G-Box receiver itself is at the very top. Uh, the onboard sensor or camera there you see in the middle. And then finally the battery to power the system during its operation. All of these are housed inside the payload bay. The G-Box itself is really probably the most advanced uh, addition or component to the UX5HP. This is what's providing a high precision uh, GNSS data capture uh, for the images in slot. Uh, it's different. It's using a PPK method to achieve its highest possible accuracy uh, versus an RTK. In other words, we've eliminated the need to establish an, an RTK setup and connection in the field. The PPK method instead provides you the ability to you know, go out quickly, fly, capture the imagery and the high precision positions, bring the data back to the office for processing. It in vir virtually has eliminated that need for ground control. One caveat, it still can be used. It will be a plus to use it, but it is possible to conduct it uh, without it. And then finally, uh, to map the most inaccessible and difficult areas with ease. This G-Box is again providing that higher level of precision that, that was not previously possible. The camera is also changed uh, from the previous model to the new UX5 HP. Uh, this is what's providing the new one centimeter ground sample distance uh, using a 35 millimeter lens, which was also a change. Uh, this has increased the coverage and speed by being able to switch these camera lenses out. So we're, we maintain the same camera body, but we're able to change the lens up to three different options, including a 25 millimeter 
for a different viewing angle. This allows you to, to capture uh, the same amount of area in less time or a larger area in the same amount of time. Overall, this camera is providing basically the highest quality worth of photos possible. Uh, the reason and why it's able to do so is really the sensor inside of the camera itself. Uh, this Sony A7R camera body employs a full frame sensor, uh, basically 2.3 times more sensor surface than the previous model, which was the Sony A5100. Uh, it's a 36 megapixel camera one of the lightest and most compact in its class. It is available in both RGB and near-infrared versions. So uh, you can capture both types of imagery, or both spectrums for that matter, uh, simply by changing out the camera body itself. Again, overall providing high quality ortho uh, and point cloud density. So I mentioned the different lens options. Here's basically what we're looking at. This is kind of a breakdown. Simply by changing these lenses, you're changing the viewing angle. So you can be at the same flight height uh, and then change the lens and end up either you know, reducing the amount of time it takes to capture that same area or basically increasing your ground sample distance or your resolution. Uh, the viewing angles are, 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 are inadvertently tied to the, to the lens focal length itself. Both the 15 and the 35 are included. The 25 millimeter is an option for this. Here's a better way to describe what I'm, what I'm talking about. Uh, here you see one image with the outer frame showing you how much area you would see with that 15 millimeter lens. And then if we switch to the 35 millimeter lens, now we see a much smaller area for the capture. Uh, this would allow greater resolution, as you saw in the previous slide, but again, a much smaller area requiring more flight time for larger areas. So overall, the Trimble UX5 HP brings three main components to the table not previously possible. Overall accuracy, efficiency, and really that flexibility thanks to those interchangeable lenses. So here's an example. Uh, this was a flight conducted in Barcelona of an F1 racing circuit at 100 meters of ground level uh, at a 1.4 centimeter ground sample distance. So here we see uh, the entire ortho mosaic. Um, not a whole lot to take away from that. I mean, you can see that it is a very good quality, but really what I want to illustrate is from this level, how great of quality or how great of a resolution could you expect? So. We can take one zoom in. This was actually what you saw previously, that 35 millimeter shot. Uh, but then we can take it even further. It turns out there's a guy standing on the side of that track that we saw all the way from that very high resolution 100 meter flight height. So just an example, as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. I think these speak for themselves. So how accurate is it? This is more so a comparison from the previous model to the current model but you do take away the differences here. Uh, overall, the resolution capability for the ground sample distance with the HP is now down to one centimeter. Uh, the root mean square elevation accuracy is down to 2.5 centimeters, up to 1,000 points per meter squared, up to 2,000 images at that 36 megapixel rating, uh, which is actually an increase, uh, even though the 2,000 number stayed the same. And then the number of points per flight also increased exponentially. So with a comparison, we're looking here again at the previous model. Basically think of this as using ground control and then not having to use ground control with the new UX5 HP and its high precision GNSS capability. It's virtually cut the amount of time that was involved in half, establishing that ground control setting out those panels and targets took an extensive amount of time that, that technically is no longer required with this solution. So transitioning now, the Trimble Access Aerial Imaging application is basically the first component of planning out your UAS operation. Uh, it is itself a mission planning application or software. 
uh, you're able to go in and actually define the areas that you're wanting to capture the imagery for. You can go further into defining those flight parameters in the actual flight planning component. Uh, it is also the flight monitoring software. So it's the same software that you take to the field on that ground control station that's running on that Trimble Yuma tablet. And then finally conduct the analysis comparing these, these images to the positions after the flight has been conducted. So this is going to run through some screenshots of, of just what's going to take place to first and plan out the mission and define the project. Uh, it begins real simply with just going to a map. Uh, on the new version, there's actually a tool to search for and zoom to the location just by typing it out. But you find that area on a map, and you simply draw a polygon of the area that you need to conduct your flight operation. From that point, you define those flight parameters. One of two ways. You set the flight height or you set that ground sample distance. One is going to change the other. They are connected. Uh, the maximum flight height, as we mentioned earlier, in the U.S. is 400 feet. So if you're trying to plan it out in the interest of time, max it out at 400 feet, that's going to adjust your ground sample distance accordingly. You can also change the lenses to capture higher resolution with you know, less amount of time. Uh, the only other component to define here is your takeoff and landing. This, again, is only pre-planning. The takeoff and landing do have to be confirmed once you're out on the ground. And you can also control the uh, entry points or entry direction from takeoff into the, to the flight lines themselves. Uh, the rule of thumb is you take off and land into the wind. These flight lines should be perpendicular to the wind. So yes, you want a crosswind as the aircraft is flying back and forth on its flight line. This again provides the most stability for imagery capture. Included in this software is an actual flight simulation or simulator. Uh, you can run this simulation, in fact it's, it's actually required, prior to the flight to aid in the planning. So as you can see here, they are near somewhat of a residential area. So if there was a, obstructions or hindrance uh, near the end of these flight lines, taller structures, taller trees, what have you, you could see in this simulation the path that the aircraft is going to take making its turns. That's essentially the part you have to worry the most about. Uh, there is a way to build in avoidance zones in the defining the project area. Uh, I will say that the aircraft will not automatically avoid those avoidance zones. That's just simply there to help you plan it out. You run this simulation to finally determine if you've drawn a plan, a flight plan, accordingly for the conditions on the ground. Next, and most importantly in this, in this application, is the flight checklist. Uh, this checklist, as you may have saw in some of those previous slides of the new Part 107 rule, is actually something that the FAA has required. You must complete an entire systems check of the aircraft. Well, this checklist is doing exactly that. Uh, it, can, it, it checks and, and covers every surface and component of the aircraft and system all the way down to the end until you're actually ready to launch the aircraft. The very last step is arming a system, uh, and then you basically take, take a step back and launch. Once the aircraft launches, you're using the same exact application. It looks just like it did in the simulator, for that matter, and you can view the aircraft in flight as it's being conducted. Uh, you're also fed in real time telemetry on the right side of the screen. That telemetry includes the signal strength, the number of satellites the aircraft is tracking, its battery state and, and overall battery time or power left the amount of time the aircraft's been in flight, your airspeed, your throttle, your flight height, all of that information is being fed back in real time to your ground control station. And then finally, you have safety maneuvers that are available. Again, this is something that the FAA has required and demanded that be present in these UAS aircraft. You have the ability to control your aircraft for emergencies. So at the bottom right of the screen, under the telemetry, 
uh, on your tablet. You can initiate any of these safety maneuvers at any time uh, for just that reason, to avoid obstacles, uh, obstructions, uh, other aircraft for that matter, or if all else fails, immediately abort the flight and begin its spiral to, uh, to make a spiral landing on the ground. Finally, the launcher component uh, is always somewhat of a uh, question. People don't like maybe so much the idea of having to use a launcher, but it, what it gives you, what it brings to the table is way more an advantage than, than, than any negative component uh, of having to use the launcher. Uh, most importantly, it's providing that consistency of launch. You have the same speed and launch angle each and every time. Uh, this is virtually eliminating the risk of a, a stalled aircraft, uh, and more so than anything, there's no moving parts on the ground. So until this aircraft clears the end of the launcher, the engine is not engaged, there's no propeller spinning, there's basically no really feasible way that the aircraft could cause an injury until after it clears the end of the launcher and has taken flight. Uh, very less stressful, very easy to use, short learning curve. You simply attach the aircraft on the launcher, tighten up some, some built-in elastics inside the casing itself, and squeeze the handle to launch it. So uh, it's, it's a, a much, much safer and better system, especially to ensure the investment in this type of, of purchase and aircraft overall. So next, now we're transitioning into the office software. We've talked about the aircraft, how to plan the flight, execute the flight. The next thing to do is to now take this imagery, transfer it, bring it to the office, and actually use it to create a product or a deliverable. So we do have two solutions on the table that are available, the Trimble Business Center Aerial Photogrammetry Module and the UAS Master Software that comes from Info. Info makes some other even more powerful photogrammetry products. The first one, our first example that we're going to run through is actually the Trimble Business Center Aerial Photogrammetry Module. We've talked already how to prepare and execute the flight. In this process that we didn't talk about, you basically choose with this HP model how you're going to provide your reference data. Are you going to use a local base station? Are you going to use a CORS or VRS network? Are you going to set ground control points? Or is accuracy not that big a deal and you're only concerned about the imagery itself? You could set it for no reference and then just take that autonomous data uh, from the aircraft. The third step is simply after the flight has been conducted, you take that Yuma control station and you create a JXL file. That's going to combine the flight log file the GNSS file, and the really not the images themselves, but the images file, the number uh, or sequential number of those images, all into one file. Then you take your base file, whichever you chose, in either that TO2 or RINEX format, and then you virtually drag and drop that into TBC's aerial photogrammetry module. Uh, you just open a create a project in TBC, literally drag and drop them, and then you're, you're really at that point ready to begin the processing itself. The first thing you do is to process those the baseline or base files. It's called the baseline trajectory uh, in the software. And then from that point, you're ready to begin. So this is some more screenshots of what it would look like. So at this point now, we've brought in the JXL file, the images, and the base file. The next thing to do would either be to tie down the ground control points, perform the baseline processing, or both for that matter. So I've got a screenshot here showing basically the tie down process. Uh, if you've done that and the baseline, after that's been done, you'll end up with something that looks like this. Here we see it in the 3D view, showing you that the images have been tied down to their corresponding ground control points. From that point, you're literally ready to create a deliverable. Uh, there's actually a new button in the current version that's called Advanced UAS that you don't see here at the top of this screenshot. But the Advanced UAS button opens up a very similar dialog on the right side of the screen. It, it does exactly that. You're, you're able to create from what you brought in. Uh, you choose 
the resolution that you're going to output, the file format of that ortho mosaic, where you want to save it at. Uh, there's a couple of three different options on the point cloud, LAS being the most common one is included. And then finally, the, the raster DSM format is also an option. Um, here you see it set in the TIFF format. You make those choices under that advanced UAS tab and, and literally hit create and you're virtually ready to go to lunch or take a coffee break. Your machine will begin tying these images together and producing not only that ortho mosaic but the point cloud and that digital surface model to go along with it. So the deliverables that you end up with first and foremost are an ortho mosaic of the flight that you conducted. Next, a digital surface model is also a, a capability or an inherent part of TBC. The point cloud itself, again, is an inherent part of this component thanks to those positions and images that are captured from the aircraft with that very high precision receiver. You can also, in TBC, create surface models, uh, contour itself. UAS Master is virtually some of the same workflow you prepare the flight, choose that reference method again, select and export the data just like you did before. Here is the one caveat, number four, you still would need TBC, either the complete or advanced version, to process those baselines if you're using the UX5 HP, and especially if you don't have ground control points to supplement that base file processing. Export that out into a CSV file, and then bring all of that into UAS Master for really more advanced photogrammetric capability. Uh, like I said, number four is the one kind of caveat there uh, that I, I want to be sure and stress. You will need access to TBC to have the full function of the UX5 HP even in the UAS Master software. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison. There is an even better comparison of these softwares actually on uh, uas.trimble.com. But the biggest one that I always like to point out is what you see here where the star is displayed, that photogrammetrist grade image processing. So that, that capability or functionality to really fine tune not only the imagery, but more so that point cloud to to be able to remove any artifacts or account for obstructions or even um, objects that are in the way of creating a true uh, natural surface uh, of, of, of the earth itself in this imagery. So, you know, removing out any obstruction that was in its way, be it a piece of equipment, uh, be it the side of a building, if you're talking about a stockpile, a conveyor belt, anything like that that needs to be removed that's possible in UAS Master, really not possible in any other solution that's out there for that matter. So that true, that true photogrammetry capability is what UAS Master brings to the table. So here's actually a local example that, that NEI we conducted uh, in Youngsville, Louisiana, just a few miles down the road from our office. Uh, this was a flight, this was actually one of three flights that were conducted uh, as part of a, a demonstration seemingly in conjunction with a show that was going on and the participants that were there that were interested in seeing these actual products take place. Uh, this flight was done in conjunction with Juniper Unmanned helping us out. So we had a UX5 flight, a UX5 HP, and a ZX5. This that you're seeing here is actually from the UX5 HP flight. Uh, almost 200 images at about a 400 foot flight height coming away with that 2.5 centimeter ground sample distance and you're not seeing all of it in this in this representation here but about a 13 acre area was flown and, and captured. Uh, I've got some zoom in detail of just our personnel that were on the ground as this flight was taking place. Another example here you see some line work brought in and overlaid for this route planning example, another key function with Trimble Business Center and the aerial photogrammetry being able to not only combine the two, uh, but really use the two in unison for this type of uh, application. Uh, progress monitoring is another valuable 
application or solution that UAS brings to the table. So if you're responsible for a construction site uh, or have a planning of a construction site taking place and you want to monitor that progress from beginning to end, being able to go out and continually execute virtually the same flight mission over and over again, you'll have imagery to, to catalog and analyze the progress uh, of, of any construction or, or uh, site progress taking place uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a site that you're responsible for. Uh, the last two examples are volume calculations of so we see in, in open pit mine itself. This was an extremely large area, 641 images. Uh, 5.6 centimeter uh, resolution. Uh, also, in the opposite, really, a uh, stockpile type situation. Here we see a resource mapping. Uh, not sure exactly what that is piled up, but the, the, the takeaway from that is, is because of that very precise point cloud, you're not only able to, to see and measurement, but conduct those volume calculations, not only of a stockpile, but of a quarry as well. And then finally, using that near-infrared camera, uh, you're able to produce these type of vegetation health analysis or really anything relative to using the near-infrared spectrum. Uh, it's essentially everything's the same except for the camera body itself, uh, and you're able to come away with these values from this spectrum of visible light. All right. so. My last portion is going to be kind of a real breakdown, a side-by-side -side comparison here of aerial imaging versus traditional surveying, uh, actual people on the ground using traditional instrumentation. So this is an example of an actual project uh, mission that was conducted. Uh, so here we see the, the basically the statistics side-by-side -side for both UAS and GNSS. Uh, GNSS being, like I said, those traditional terrestrial instrumentations on the ground. The biggest difference here to talk about is the total time. Uh, six and a half hours compared to 32 and a half hours of an actual crew out on the ground collecting this data uh, ends up being about times faster. This example was actually conducted prior to the UX5HP, uh, so the horizontal and vertical accuracies are somewhat different, but now I would believe that the HP would produce virtually that same level of accuracy, uh, both for horizontal and vertical, using uh, not only that G-Box, uh, but especially combining that with ground control as well. So. This is, this is the actual example, a topographic survey example here. Uh, the top model is from the UAS, uh, producing some 300,000 measurements. Uh, you can see clearly the density uh, in the graphic or in the, in the image itself is, is more detailed, uh, whereas the traditional instrumentation, the surface model on the ground from the GNSS instrumentation, still produced 100,000 measurements, which is a lot, but you can clearly see the distinct differences, really more so that that aerial solution is providing versus ground scanning. So overall, the target market for UAS, to be honest, are really wide open. Some of the most common ones that we see the use in today, uh, first and foremost, are engineering and surveying applications. Uh, to date, most of the customers that, that we've exclusively worked with have been related to engineering and surveying and then oil and gas one way or another, uh, but also mining, civil and heavy earthworks. Uh, we've also done some business in that avenue as well uh, with our partner SciTech for some heavy, heavy machinery, uh, as well as environmental and landfill, uh, public agencies, obviously uh, government entities and state agencies for that matter have a a larger responsibility for, for data collection and, and really the analysis of, so UAS provides a, a truly exceptional way for tackling some of those large project areas. And then finally, agriculture and forestry uh, probably ends up being even more one of the biggest markets out there. Uh, agriculture, Trimble Ag Division was actually the first to receive the use of the Trimble Air, or the UAS aircraft, uh, and there is a just a, a lot of use 
for flying tree stands, flying agriculture, crop production, all of that applies to, to, to an aerial imaging solution more so than any other. All right, so at this time I'm going to transition and switch it over to, uh, to our partners at Juniper Unmanned, and they're going to talk specifically uh, about the training and services that they offer. Um, stand by just a second while we make them the presenter. All right, uh, Chad, are you able to uh, see my screen there now just to verify? I am. You are good to go. Um, hi, this is uh, Jeff Cozart. I'm the CEO of uh, Juniper Unmanned, and we are a partner with Trimble and with uh, NEI uh, to uh, support your unmanned aircraft operations. And um, uh, the um, if, you, if you think about uh, unmanned uh, aircraft operations, say a hundred years ago, uh, if you were to have gone out and purchased an air airplane, uh, you know, immediately you would have had a lot of uh, thoughts and uh, questions about how you were going to operate that. There would be you know, questions about how do I fly so that I don't uh, crash and, and uh, hurt myself or hurt somebody on the ground. There would also be questions about uh, how, do, how do I take off and land? Where do I do that from? Uh, what are the regulations in in the skies, and and uh, how do I make sure that I'm um, being compliant with the uh, the public policy of the time? Uh, how do I maintain the aircraft and make sure that it's uh, usable not only today but uh, for future flights? And I have, I have uh, ongoing sustainability of my uh, overall operations. Um, in the um, uh, hundred years that have passed since uh, that time, of course our society has developed out a, a very sophisticated protocol for, uh, for aviation and for conducting flight. But beyond the regulatory environment of the FAA, there's a set of infrastructure that is accessible to the pilot. Uh, the, the things like, um, you know, the, the, the uh, Aircraft fuel is available through an FBO at the airport. Uh, there's uh, air traffic controllers that are that are looking at uh, at the regulation regulation and making sure that uh, we don't uh, have confliction in the sky. And there's uh, there's uh, people out there that offer uh, training services on how to become a pilot. It's a very sophisticated environment when it comes to aviation, and unmanned aircraft is really no exception uh, to uh, to that rule. Uh, what's happened, though, here as we've had this nexus of technology uh, in recent times that have created uh, created some unique opportunities, uh, we are back in many ways uh, to that square one uh, of trying to figure out uh, as a society what the protocols are that are going to uh, take a, an interesting piece of technology and generate long-term sustainable return on, it, on your investment. And so Juniper Unmanned is very much involved in, uh, with Trimble and with the NEI to uh, build a protocol, build a, sesta, a system of uh, infrastructure to support you with your flight. And uh, so uh, what we'd like to do is uh, sort of uh, start this off by giving you a little bit of background on, uh, on Juniper Unmanned. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, uh, Matt uh, on my team here, Matt Tompkins, will uh, take over and walk through uh, some of the, the pieces of Part 107 and what's relevant uh, uh, to you. And then uh, we'd like to specifically talk about uh, training uh, and uh, what you can do to uh, not only prepare for the uh, Part 107 uh, 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 the testing that's a, the aeronautical knowledge test that's available uh, uh, going to be required there, but also how you can become uh, proficient so that uh, you're uh, 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 creating the best opportunity uh, to generate the return on investment and uh, make sure that uh, you you can keep your aircraft in a in a sustainable readiness ready to, uh, 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 state so that it's ready to fly. Uh, so let's start uh, with a, a little background on Juniper Unmanned. Uh, we are in Golden, Colorado, uh, founded uh, just two years ago. But uh, the, t the team that uh, founded uh, Juniper Unmanned uh, is a very sophisticated uh, team of uh, people that uh, have operated uh, uh, in three different areas. Uh, the first area is uh, that I myself come out of academics. Uh, and uh, conducted uh, research flight with unmanned aircraft since 2009 uh, for uh, major research universities. Uh, a couple of uh, other people on our team also come out of uh, ac the academic field. 
We also, the, the bulk of our field is actually made up of, uh, of our team is made up of people that operated in the military, uh, specifically the U United States Army. We have a number of uh, people on our team that uh, were operators of the shadow system, uh, uh, and that's actually the most widely flown unmanned aircraft in the world, um, but uh, it doesn't get a lot of the attention that some of the other uh, sexy systems like the Predator uh, get, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very widely flown as a, as a, a surveillance aircraft. And uh, our team developed the uh, training and standardization programs with, uh, uh, with Textron and, with, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, operated the uh, training, uh, the schoolhouse at uh, Fort Huachuca in Sierra Vista, Arizona. So it's a, a, a good group of, a team, uh, of our team comes out of that military experience. And the third piece is, is uh, the FAA, where we have, uh, some, have an air traffic uh, uh, controller that uh, works, uh, works on our public policy uh, side, that uh, he, he, he makes sure that uh, everything that we're uh, doing to provide support you is uh, in compliance with, uh, with uh, the FAA and where things are headed. Uh, so what are the things that uh, Juniper on Man can do to support you in that return on investment? And that, uh, when we look at the point here on professional services offering, the first thing that obviously comes to mind for most people is training. And uh, Matt, again, Matt will go through a little bit more detail of the training. But again, uh, Juniper on Man is the official training provider for, uh, for Trimble on the UX5, UX5HP, and the ZX5. And uh, so we do that in collaboration with NEI. So if you uh, if you need to access uh, training, you need to talk to uh, your NEI uh, uh, representative uh, there to uh, to get signed up for for training. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we, uh, Juniper Unmanned offers um, uh, the uh, the maintenance and services uh, side of the aircraft systems uh, to uh, help work with you to make sure that uh, your aircraft is technically ready to fly. And then uh, we also uh, work on uh, 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 with Tremble and with Caterpillar on the uh, development of uh, concepts of operation or operational designs uh, that are are uh, uh, help you to utilize your aircraft in new uh, new ways that uh, uh, generate um, uh, that return in the field. Uh, the final thing that I'd like to mention as a part of our professional services uh, offering is that we do, in support of you, conduct uh, flights, right? So if, if you have a need uh, in your developing of your capabilities uh, for us to be a part of your team and to, to come out and support your flights, uh, your field the level of field support that you need to utilize your system directly, Jim Brown Man is there. Uh, in other words, we've got your back on, on all of that. So. Uh, that's, that is, uh, that, that is our, our, the basic uh, proposition that we make to you is that uh, we're here for you. Uh, we're here to support you to make sure that you're successful uh, with your, uh, with your uh, experience with the Trumbull products. Uh, the last item on the list here, software products, the Sparrow Flight Management System is, is a very uh, powerful uh, operational tool that uh, can help you to uh, plan out your flights to make sure that you're uh, flying those in a safe, effective, and compliant manner. Uh, think of this as a project management tool that's uh, sort of combi combined with a fleet uh, management uh, system. Uh, so we're looking at the maintenance of the aircraft, the, the qualifications of the personnel that are flying those aircraft, and then we're tracking all of that in a, in a set of uh, flight logs uh, so that uh, you, you can uh, manage the, uh, the, your assets and make sure that, again, that, they're, that you're getting the most, uh, most out of them. Uh, that, that flight management system is, is uh, again, available uh, in partnership with NEI. Um, you can check out the details of it at sparrowflight.com. Um, and uh, at this point, I'd like to tur turn over um, uh, the microphone here to Matt Tompkins on our team. Uh, Matt is, uh, is, uh, uh, does the compliance work for Juniper Unmanned, and he'll walk uh, through the, uh, the, the training and, uh, and part 107 and uh, really what it means to you. All right, so thanks everybody for uh, tuning in. Uh, so like Jeff said, I'm going to cover uh, some of the compliance stuff and then our training. Uh, so Chad did a great job uh, talking about part 107, but I'll kind of go over it here again. Um, first of all, um, what is part 107? Uh, part 107 is the uh, regulations that allow you to operate your UAS, your, your system, uh, for commercial purposes. Uh, and up until now, you had to receive an exemption uh, from the regulations that prevented you from doing that. 
Uh, second of all, it's the first step for the FAA in allowing uh, broader operations of a UAS system. Um, it is the plan that uh, as time goes on, the FAA will take a step-by-step -step approach to allowing you to do more with your aircraft. And then it provides a less restricted path. Uh, like, like we talked about, like Chad talked about, you, know, you have a, now have a clear defined uh, path to getting a certificate to be a UAS operator or pilot. Um, and the rules are very clear and defined. Uh, so it breaks down into sort of three, uh, three categories, operational, pilot, and aircraft. Um, these are the operational requirements. Chad uh, covered uh, quite a few of these, so we'll kind of just breeze over them real quick. Um, less than 55 pounds, visual line of sight, daylight, uh, less than 100 miles an hour, uh, 400 feet above ground level or above the structure for inspection purposes. Uh, the operation, um, operations in controlled airspace are now allowed, um, but you need to get permission to do that. Um, the operations outside of controlled airspace, like G airspace, uh, can be conducted without permission. Um, uh, operations from moving vehicles are allowed uh, in sparsely or unpopulated areas. This is great for linear operations. Uh, Pre-flight inspection is required. Visual observer is encouraged, but not required. And the conditions within Part 107 are waivable with, um, with clear, clearly defined safety uh, measures in place. Uh, pilot requirements. So remote pilot certificate. This is probably the biggest, uh, biggest news out of, out of Part 107. Um, up until this point, you're required to have a pilot certificate, a manned pilot certificate, um, making this a very prohibitive uh, Thing to do, very expensive. So now you have a very clear, very easy path towards getting that remote pilot certificate. Uh, certificate requires passing an aeronautical knowledge test. This is very basic uh, criteria like airspace, um, what, how UAV reacts uh, aerodynamically, um, your crew resource management, things like that. Uh, Part 61 certificate holders, um, these are your manned aircraft pilots. They have an easier path to getting that. Um, Certificate, and then um, if you're not a uh, certificate holder, then you have simple test, um, uh, a course, and then a test, and you have your remote pilot certificate. Uh, and then the person controlling the aircraft only needs to be supervised by someone with a remote pilot certificate. Not everybody on the controls needs to have that certificate. And then aircraft requirements. Registration of the aircraft is required. Um, aircraft markings are required. You'll be given a unique identifier that needs to go on the uh, aircraft. The pre-flight inspection is required. Um, the FAA suggests a maintenance program. They don't have anything defined as many of these aircraft are very different. They leave that up to the, the operator. Um, same with airworthiness. Uh, the airworthiness is really up to you as the operator. And um, the remote pilot is in, in command is the ultimate authority. Everything falls back on them. Um, they're the ultimate, uh, have the ultimate responsibility for a safe flight. Uh, so the operator training. Um, this is Juniper's uh, uh, focus is to put together a training program for you guys that, uh, or we have a training program for you guys that um, covers these subjects. Uh, regulations, the airspace, weather, uh, UAS performance, crew resource management, inspection, and the basic maintenance. Um, beyond the tests, you have the mission planning, hands-on applications, practices, and then how to uh, operate your system effectively and safely. Um, big ones are this training will prepare you for the aeronautical knowledge test. Uh, those top um, bullet points there are all going to be on that, uh, that test, and Juniper, Juniper's training is tailored to prepare you for that. Um, but it does go beyond that uh, with the mission planning, the hands-on application in the field, and how to essentially operate your system and your whole program safely. Uh, with Part 107, the airworthiness, the inspection, the maintenance is all on the operator. Uh, you need to understand what that means and how to do that in a, in a way that is effective and so that you have a productive, um, safe program that uh, is, provides that good return on investment. Um, that is our slogan, safe, effective, and compliant UAS operations. And that is what we do with our training. So we provide you with that solution. 
So this is uh, Jeff Tozart again. I know we're uh, getting close to wrapping up here, and so I just wanted to say that uh, you know, from the standpoint of training, you know, a lot of people will look at uh, at uh, a training and the Part 107 requirements and the aeronautical knowledge test, and consider that uh, 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 that uh, you know, with the new Part 107 out, that not a whole lot of training is required. And what I would say is that I think it's a real uh, it's a mistake for those uh, organizations who try to operate without uh, training and without the ongoing coaching and support. <clears throat> Again, using that uh, the analogy of uh, uh, manned aircraft operations from 100 years ago, those organizations that figured out how to uh, operate in a safe, effective, compliant uh, manner, those were the ones that uh, survived and thrived. It, was, it wasn't the individuals out there that, uh, that, that, that tried to get by with the minimum. It was the, end of, it was the organizations who said, hey, let, let's look at this from a sustainable, ongoing um, <clears throat> proposition. And uh, so our, uh, our belief is that, uh, that a lot, there's a lot of exuberance in the marketplace right now as a result of Part 107, uh, and uh, we, we, uh, I'm happy for that, and I also want to temper that uh, exuberance by, by saying uh, you know, we can see that there's a long-lasting uh, future uh, in unmanned aircraft operations if we do things uh, in the right way. Uh, and uh, so we're here prepared to help you, uh, help you with uh, accomplishing that goal. Uh, so, Chad, I think uh, with, with that, I'd like to hand it back to you and make, make sure that uh, everybody's had their uh, questions answered. All right. Well, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that. And uh, thank you guys for elaborating on uh, what's available uh, from Juniper Unmanned. Uh, at this time, we'll go ahead and take your questions, uh, if there are any out there. Uh, we have just a, a couple that have been submitted already. Um, first was, is there any... Uh, video of this presentation. Uh, actually, this entire webinar has been recorded and uh, it will be provided uh, for view later if you want to, to watch and, and, and go back over anything that we've discussed today. Uh, and it will also be available for those who weren't able to make it online with us today. Uh, the second question is, is there an opportunity to demo the Trimbo Info US Master Software? Uh, there actually is, and in fact, you can demo both uh, UAS Master as, as well as, as Trimble Business Center. Uh, and there is also a free download for the Trimble Access Aerial Imaging application. Uh, I recently actually published a video on how to install that uh, that's on our NEI GPS YouTube page if you're interested. Uh, for the other demonstration, just contact us or, or any of your Trimble representatives for that matter to request. Uh, a demo license of UAS Master or Trimble Business Center, and, and we can affiliate those needs for you. Finally, uh, how well does the UX5 HP operate in urban areas? Uh, how much detail is captured between structures? So, uh, for the, the answer is for the fixed wing aircraft, uh, really more so the UX5 and the UX5 HP. This is a course a a, a, a direct straight down approach this this AV aircraft do not take oblique imagery uh, if that's a part of the relative to your question. Um, it is a, of course a direct down approach so I mean it's not going to technically capture the you know the sides of, of, of structures or buildings especially if they're straight up and down. Uh, that's more so what oblique imagery is meant for. Uh, there is some possibility there with our DX5 multi-rotor aircraft if, if that is of interest. Uh, you know, if, if, if structures on the ground, building, uh, any, any ground assets for that matter, if, you, if you're wanting to fly those in a way to, to have a more uh, side visual view than the, than the multi-rotor solution, the DX5 may be more applicable uh, for that type of application. Uh, so if there's any other questions uh, that you guys have, uh, please, please feel free to submit those now. Uh, we have basically reached the end of our, our time here, so uh, I do appreciate everyone joining us today. If, if there's any questions that you have following the webinar today, please feel free to send those in to us for more information. Uh, we are here to, to help you in any way whatsoever. Uh, the webinar will be made available. Recording has been processed, 
Uh, in the meantime, feel free to visit us online at neigs.com to find more information on our products and solutions. Uh, I want to thank Juniper again for helping us out today and thank all of you who attended.